Well, first of all, thank you. Thank you very much to the gallery for organizing this and bringing us together to have this conversation. My sort of entry point here is a longtime interest in how objects take on the status of being a work of art and also how in certain instances they might uh, lose that status. And this is something that is complex enough in relation to studio-based practice, uh, but you know, there is still some sense that when the object goes out the door of the studio, that it, is, it might, might in fact at that point be a work of art. Um, the moment of transition is far, far more complex in relation to post-studio practice and where there is a negotiation of one kind or another between artist and fabricator. And of course, that's where we are. That's the point of discussion that we're going to have tonight. I, my own engagement with uh, these questions around minimalism and particularly and around Judd in particular, are, that has happened in a couple of phases in addition to the, the essay for the, the catalog about uh, Untitled 1980. So the first phase was looking at the Ponza papers at the Getty uh, uh, special collections where they're held and really trying to understand the conflict between a number of the artists that the Ponza has collected. And that, those papers are, are interesting because they reflect a conflict that was the sort of early stages of the afterlife of the work, uh, the first couple of decades. Um, then my uh, second major opportunity was participating as um, a member of the v advisory committee for the Guggenheim's Ponza Collection Initiative, uh, led by Jeffrey Weiss, Francesca Esme, and, and Ted Mann, which uh, was realized through a series of meetings in uh, uh, 2011 through 2013, uh, then a a symposium in 2019, and then a really wonderful publication that just came out this year. And so basically, uh, uh, one of the things that, that is really uh, interesting to think about is this ongoing process of the afterlife of a work of art. And so I, what I really am hoping that we'll, t we'll get a chance to talk with Peter about is these two different stages. First, the pr involvement in the creation of the work in the first place, but also your involvement in the work's afterlife. And so as a uh, sort of, we're definitely gonna talk a lot about Untitled um, 1980 because it's a really monumental achievement and all kinds of really great details that I've heard from Peter and I think we wanna get on record for everyone else to hear. But I was hoping we could actually start a little bit with you talking more generally about how you be started to work with Donald Judd as a fabricator. I, I um, started working for Judd at Spring Street in 1969 and built a lot of the fifth floor and part of the first floor. And within about a year, uh, he said, can you make this? And the first piece I made, for, I, I had also done a restoration for him before that, but in 1971, I made the first plywood piece for him. Uh, and then I really liked doing that. Uh, and, and he saw the po possibilities uh, in it. Uh, I like that better than working on the building, although I like doing architecture. But um, when that first piece, piece got made, it meant that plywood, uh, unpainted plywood could be, um, he could use it again. And a short, a short version of, of what that was about was that Judd had used plywood in the 60s himself, but all those pieces, if you, if you have access to one of the catalog resumes, all those pieces were painted. And one of the reasons they were painted was because Douglas fir plywood, which I hope we'll talk about Douglas fir plywood because it's very important to this whole story. There's a nice fresh piece of 40-year-old of, uh, Douglas fir plywood there over on the table. But th there's a couple of things in Judd. First, before, at, as a starter, the non-composition, i.e. found system, is really important. Delegating the work to somebody else 
which is a kind of foundness is really important, and uh, a found materials. And plywood, Douglas fir plywood, which is the everything plywood, as far as he was concerned when he started making art, and probably still now, um, for most people, if you say plywood, this is the plywood you're thinking of, because everything else is cherry plywood, or birch plywood, or walnut plywood, and plywood plywood is Douglas fir. It's the plywood that is used for crates and underlayment of floors and roofing, and it's, it is plywood, and it absolutely is not um, furniture plywood. And that's very important, that it not be confused with furniture because of the, form, the, the box-like forms of most of Judd's work. I knew Judd pretty well by that time. I liked him. I worked for him until the day he died, and I, I knew what good mechanics, there, there's a, a, an old-fashioned term of, be, of being a good mechanic. It doesn't mean fixing cars, but it means a good workman, I guess is what it means. Um, I liked that part of doing this, and I was good at it, and I was a quick learner. And when it became possible to, to cut plywood without chipping it, it opened up a whole world of, of doing plywood pieces, and they were plywood pieces, and nobody could quite figure out what they were at the time. They are these mock-ups for metal pieces. They were pieces of, of their own, in their own right. But when Judd was making them himself, his hand skills had reached its, their, the limit, but the limit did not quite get to making unpainted plywood. And if you paint plywood, you can cover up a lot of chips with spackle. And um, when, you don't, when you don't have the chips, you can use plywood as plywood. And one other thing about plywood, and we're, I'm sort of getting a little too much into plywood here, but it's, it's another thing about, um, um, well, I think that you, a, a really good argument could be made that plywood in Judd, all the way through, all the way till the end, plywood was a leader in his work. Pieces were done in plywood that were later done in metal. They were in, in no ways mock-ups. Um, the pieces that you all may know up at Adia were years before similar pieces were done later in aluminum. But anyway, I started working for him and I, I, uh, I didn't work except for one really prominent and um, germane exception. I didn't work on the pieces that I made for him at Spring Street. I did it at my place, which is a block and a half away on Green Street. The only piece that was ever done at Spring Street is this piece, because it's too big, it was too big for my shop. And so I had Spring Street, which until 1980 was Judd doing permanent installation. This is a whole other story I won't talk about, but it was permanent installation had its birth at Spring Street with a really large plywood piece from Castelli that was reinstalled there. That had to come down. In order to build this, I needed the whole floor. I bought big tools, brought them in. I needed all the wall space to move these pieces around and grade them, and where am I gonna put these defects in the material? The material is special order, but there's still defects in it, and you have to kind of shift those around. And some of those things you might have seen before this, some of those little square red and green squares are um, strategizing where you can where you can hide where you can hide the bad stuff. So um, anyway I, I worked for Judd, you know, starting in 71, making pieces. I like Martha am very interested in the subject of fabrication. And I think it's its strength for Judd. It meant he could do what he could do and he didn't have to um, supervise it. And that's, uh, that might sound a little shocking, but if he had, his control of the pieces w w was based on getting somebody who he trusted, whom he trusted, um, and letting them, and delegating it to them, and mostly this worked out over all these years. Uh, there's a couple of cases where it didn't work out, famous ones, Ponza is, is one of them. And um, 
my one last story, and I'm going to hand it back to you, but I, uh, my house is a block and a half away from my shop and house, a block and a way, a half away from Judd's building. And I was good friends with him all the way until he died. And he always had an, a, uh, an invitation to come over to the shop and look at things if you wanted to. I, it wasn't a secret shop. And he only came to that building one time, and that was 1973 when I bought the building because he liked old buildings. It's an 1825 building, he liked old buildings, but it was absolutely not to, um, to inspect the work going on there. And this, is, this might sound shocking at first, but it, it really isn't. It puts a lot of responsibility on the fabricator, um, unless there's a real kind of sink going on between the, the two. And I'm, I think that's more than you were looking for, as, as, as my background with Judd, so. Um. Well, I, I, you know, there are a lot of things that you've talked to me about in the, the process of getting to this piece. And I, I don't know how many people had a chance to see this piece. I was, I, uh, came just before it was disassembled in, in September uh, after it was in sort of this very large piece in hiding because of the, the, the shutdown uh, just as it opened. But it's you know, this amazing tour de force. And uh, you've talked to me a little bit about the, the, the process of building up to making a piece like this, that you started out with uh, much more construction grade materials uh, that you that you over time moved away from uh, from plywood that had a lot of uh, visible plugs for the knots uh, that had voids that you were uh, you know gradually building an aesthetic in, in in the work over over the decade that was leading up to this piece. The first couple of pieces that I did, or first several pieces I did for him, I bought the plywood locally on Wooster Street at, at uh, Canal Lumber. And the problem, uh, any of you have worked in Douglas Fir, especially now, but even back then, the problem is when you have defects or patches in it, um, it's so, and the, the forms are so simple and you're not given a lot of uh, exit ramps, uh, 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 to, to look, to, to not pay attention to, you see all these kind of plugs and it can look like a Larry Poons painting if you don't watch out. Like an early Larry Poons with, with the lozenges. And it looks, if you have a sheet of plywood and there are five plugs in it and you're going to cut it into smaller pieces, where are you gonna cut those? Are you gonna cut them so the plug is in the middle? or that it's half cut off, you have to, it, you're much better off if you can somehow up the level of the plywood so that you don't have those. And you could say, well, is this really, is this really found object plywood or not? Because you've gone to, uh, you've, you've done a special order in Oregon to get this really good plywood. But if you don't do it, you have a piece with a lot of detail that has nothing to do with the artist. Um, and it doesn't really have to do with the plywood either because you, by cutting it, have arranged where those defects are going to occur. Th there's a lot of interesting things about this that it, you, there is no such thing as perfect plywood, even a special order like this, even in 1980, uh, when old growth Douglas fir was easier to come by. So I, I'm not sure that was where you're going with this question, but... Well, I think there's an interesting interplay there because on the one hand, uh, as, as you've described it and as I've, I've certainly uh, understood it from other contexts as well, uh, Donald Judd was interested in the standard sheet of plywood, the four by eight. Yes. And so interested in a certain kind of given. And yet, once you start to dig down, it's 
uh, that given is also maybe custom ordered. Uh, you told me that you had to cut these down ever so slightly from mm -hmm. the four by eight to get the right, to get a good edge. Because the edges, otherwise, it's got strap marks and mm -hmm. chalk marks on it. And so yes. Forth. So, so, and and a similar thing that happens in relation to Dan Flavin's work, where the 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 fixtures become more and more uh, manipulated and and finished. So that there's a, there's a very interesting thing that happens around the idea of something that's found, but then maybe maybe not wanting everything that's associated with the found. Or as close as you can come to it. So this piece has uh, a lot of found, the most maybe the most basic found measurements in American building in it. Within a little bit of tolerance on it, the units are four feet by eight feet. The, the verticals are four feet by four feet, like the biggest square you can make out of a sheet, standard sheet of plywood. And the way you have this stepping down here is four inches. So it's based on a division of the units in quarters, halves, three quarters on the horizontal as well, but also four inch and then four inch. And four inches is a really important measurement for Judd. It's everybody who's any, ever done any building has four inches is, it's the basis. And it's a two by four is in theory four inches, the four inch part of it. And um, he, Judd uses, if any of you have been to Marfa, some of you have been to Marfa, I think, the, um, the pieces in the ranch office, the found object pieces in this wonderful building in Marfa, red painted pieces uh, with found objects, those pieces are all four inches deep. And four, four, four feet by four feet by four inches deep, it's, it's classic. And he doesn't have to um, make drawings and, and decide which is a, what's a, a pleasing uh, performance. There is no, there's no vertical and no horizontal axis, it's a square. It's pure Judd, and this, this piece is pure Judd also. So something else that was interesting to me when you described your, your working process was the way that you know, over time you really began to understand what, what qualities he was after. So that there are a relatively limited number of drawings for this piece. Um, Almost zero. Right? Yeah, so, um, so, so except the drawings that you did in order to, to clarify your understanding. And to um, work out the angles, that's, that's what that plywood piece is with all the pencil lines on it. It's to figure out the angles, and they're very um, much more complex an angles than it looks like in this photograph. And, and you've told me that there were many more drawings, not necessarily drawings made by Donald Judd, but drawings uh, made in the working process for pieces made by Berenstein. Um, sometimes, yeah. and sometimes no drawings. Uh -huh. and, and, you know, um, and, uh, there isn't a real drawing. That thing that's on one of the tables there, the, the schematic, 1981, January 1981 schematic, is me putting on paper what was a discussion with Judd, but not a drawing from Judd, to send it back to the office. So the office had the same thing I did. And uh, we talked, we just talked about the system. You don't need to know the system on this piece. The system is really a lot more about the making of the piece or the designing of the piece. In, in Judd's case, the designing of the piece. There is a there is a one, two, three, four, five, one through twenty, and and uh, twenty one through thirty. You know, there there, there is a system that they're, that they're designed by, and they're not shuffled like Judd sometimes shuffles them to make it a little more demanding. That you really look at them and you can't, you, you just don't look at it and figure it out. This one is complicated enough without shuffling them. It is a one, two, three, four, five, uh, left to right and 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 down. Um, but you, some people have trouble figuring this out, and I even if I haven't looked at it for a while, I have to kind of try to remember what the system was. But it's a four, it's based on quarters and halves and three quarters and four inch um, measurements. So maybe you could just talk a little bit more about how Donald Judd communicated what he wanted if it wasn't through drawings. And discussions, usually at Spring Street. I, my, my place is a, is a block and a half away from Spring Street. Um, I, I was fine with that. And um, occasionally there is a drawing. Sometimes there's a drawing if it's something new that hasn't 
where there could be confusion. I, I mean, I knew the system and I worked out the system as far as building it's concerned. In the Bernstein brothers drawings that we talked about, that you've seen some of them, when Bernstein did shop drawings, they're quite com complicated and they're with a lot of details and curves and well drawn and, and all that. But Bernstein Brothers, the, the company that made most of the sheet metal pieces, was bigger than I was. And they had an office and they had a workshop, work floor. And the guy making the drawings had to make sure the guy on the machines was doing the right thing. So there's two people involved. There's Judd, a third person if you, if you count Judd, right? And I'm um, uh, myself. And so for me to do a drawing, to hand it to myself, unless it's on a piece of plywood like this or on the back of an envelope, it doesn't make sense. So I don't have drawings like Bernstein has drawings because I didn't need to do it because I'm the same person. So um, this piece took uh, around nine months to make. And we were in, the first installation was at, at Castelli. We were in the gallery from July 11th till just before the show opened on, on September 10th in 81. The interesting thing about this piece is it's a floor piece and it's a wall piece at the same time. And it's too big to build and then push it back to the wall. It has to be, I mean, this piece is insanely heavy. And it has a base, and we had a base here on 21st Street as well. We had to, because you're never gonna find a really flat floor, and it's a grid. And if you start building a grid on something that's doing this, and Castell, this floor was terrible, you have to do it. Judd pieces don't have pedestals. It's a kind of a rule on the, on, on the T-shirt that says no pedestals. But we, you, we had to do it, and we had to do it at 21st Street as well. Quick story about Judd uh, and, de and delegation. If, do you have time for this? or you, do you, I think I told you this story, but the piece doesn't have any uh, visible screws on it. And um, it, it was getting very close to the opening. And as far as I know, the first, time, the first and only time that he ever saw this before the opening, was about two days before the opening when he came over to the gallery, nervously to the gallery. Was I gonna be done on time? Was it, did it work? Um, I said, Don, um, do you wanna see the back? Do you wanna see it from behind? It's quite interesting. It, to me, it was like the, the coal mine in the basement of the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago. It was like a coal mine with, you know, um, um, strung up, uh, light bulbs and it, it, it's fantastic. And I said, Don, do you want to see it? And he said, no. And I had already been working for him for quite a long time by then. And I was sort of proud of all, all the latest um, 18th century um, engineering tricks I had used on the back there. And uh, I realized that for him, this is the piece. And all that other stuff in behind is not the piece. And he doesn't want to know it. And he doesn't want to hear fabricators telling him that, no, no, you have to use a thicker, a thicker galvanized on this. It, otherwise, you might have a, a warp. It's up to the fabricator to make it work, if at all possible. And, that's, and so he's not going to design his car uh, based on a wind tunnel or an aerodynamic with engineers telling him, uh, how to do it, he, he figures out the piece and it's up to the fabricator to make it work. It usually worked. There's a few situations where it didn't work, but um, it, it usually worked. And the deciding to make this piece inch and three eighths plywood, which is a very special, it's a special order. Um, three quarters wouldn't have, it would have sagged too much and one inch would have sagged too much and inch and a half would have been too bulky and uh, so a lot of that stuff is being left up to the fabricator, who hopefully has a, uh, a feel for that stuff. Um, so I, I think that's answering your question more or less, right? So you know, my entry point into this was 
the fabrication that went wrong, wrong, wrong uh, with the uh, uh, Giuseppe Panza and the various works that were bought on the basis of plans. And uh, it wasn't actually until the, the uh, Guggenheim's uh, Panza Collection Initiative study where I actually got to see the physical object, but I had seen photographs and you know, could certainly tell what, what some of the issues were from the, the documentation. Um, seeing seeing the, the, what the Guggenheim brought together for that study really showed you know, very dramatically that an interpretation of a plan could, could be very off from what the, the aesthetic that we've come to expect around Judd Plywood works. And so there's an interesting part of that, which was that for four of those works, four of the very um, early pieces from 72, 73, you were asked to draw some very detailed plans and uh, to provide those detailed plans to Giuseppe Panza. And you've told me that you re really regretted uh, doing that, that you were asked to do what you did, what you were asked to do, but you regretted it because even though the plans were extre extremely detailed, there was still a lot left up to the interpretation. There, there were, there were, it should have been a hundred page book or something, you know, and um, we, sh we shouldn't have done it. I, I, we talked about it before this, whether I was being asked to do it, told to do it, and there's some, draw we, there's some drawings, but you have to, why was it done? Why I was involved in this is a slightly I, I don't talk about Ponza too much because I was slightly involved in the whole. I'm, my name is all over the place on that on that Ponza thing. Um, Ponza didn't want to spend the money to bring American plywood over and to bring me over to do it, and so he was trying to do it to save money, or it was a power. I mean, or it was a power thing a collector versus artist power thing. I think it was part of that. And so he, we have perfectly good um, old world craftsmen in, in Italy, and we'll, we'll do it here in Italy. And you, when you do instructions like that based on what you assume are woodworking skill, universal woodworking skills, and then they don't do it. They don't, you know, whether those slots are cut all the way through in the end, and just, you, you almost can't believe that. And, I, I, I would argue that J Judd's delegation almost always worked. This is a case where it didn't, because I, I think that I think the collector artist um, power argument, who the collector feels that he, it's these artists are supplying of raw materials and, and it's a, a collection is a great is the, is the whole thing, and the artist doesn't feel that way. So, but. It went wrong. Um, question of whether it's fixable or not, we, that's not up for us to say, right? I mean, the Ponza situation is much more complicated than that. You know, you know it better than anybody with all the paperwork. But. Well, I think, I think they're actually, the, the, the people who were involved in the Guggenheim study know those, the, those things in and out at this point. And, and actually, there's a pretty amazing publication that came out of that that has a really detailed case study about another piece that became a, an issue, it was a, a 1974 piece that was originally created for the Liston Gallery in London and then uh, sold to, pa to Ponza based on plans because there were, unlike this piece, there was no idea that that initial exhibition would, uh, the, where the object would be retained from that. So the, you know, this is quite different in the sense that this, this was meant to be retained all, all from start to finish. Uh, the Listen piece was not meant to be retained. It was sold to Ponza on the basis of a plan. And then when Ponza agreed to lend it to the um, LA MOCA in 1983, uh, uh, Judd insisted that Peter go out and build it. But build it in New York and it went and assembled it in, in yeah. LA, yeah. And that still exists, right? Mm -hmm. And and also that you you be involved in the disassembly. Uh, have you seen? Yeah, and have you seen the pay, all the paperwork? You probably know more about the paperwork than I do. But did it? I, I don't. I didn't see that he must do this um, paperwork. There's probably a big file on it, right? 
Yes, where, where actually, Judd has already been burned by Ponza, Ponza at that time, at that point, and is not going to do it again, or he his position is is in a, he's in better position with Ponza to insist that it be made, and it's and it's in the U.S. We're not we're not talking about Italy. Yes. We're talking about the U.S. So. Yeah, and there were a lot of other complications about what would happen to it afterwards. Mm -hmm. And actually, uh, Lena, who is here, could certainly uh, has a lot of that expertise, um, much more expertise probably on some of the, the ins and outs of the, the, the paper trail than I do. Uh, there's a, a, a one other example, short example, of, of where fabrication went a little awry it was with Judd, Judd and, and Bernstein Brothers. Did I ever tell you about this? Story. Well, I, I don't know if you told me, but I certainly think there are probably people here who have. Bernstein Brothers is, is very, Bernstein Brothers started uh, fabricating for Judd in 1964. And uh, I started in 1971, but Bernstein is the, is the senior and very famous name in Bernstein fabrication. And uh, there's, you, we could talk about that, that's a whole other story. But um, in 1977, Bernstein Brothers made a, a large aluminum piece on a commission to go to the University of, of um, Northern Kentucky. And Judd, in the way that I talked about, try to avoid unnecessary detail. Detail is a kind of writing, and these pieces are not meant to have handwriting or any other kind of signaling on them. Do this piece without screws showing. Do this big uh, outdoor, uh, floor piece, aluminum floor piece with as few screws as possible. You have to have a few. Um, um, Judd said, I know I don't want so many screws. I, I don't want it to look like a dotted line to, uh, on these side panels. Just use a few screws. And Bernstein did it. And the piece went out and was installed in 1977 in northern Kentucky. And um, we were all there to see it installed and so forth. And, and um, there started to be complaints. I, I don't have a drawing of this piece, but the light could come through. You could see light through it because it wasn't, fa it wasn't fastened tightly enough. These big, thick, at least half inch thick plates of aluminum had a certain warping. And um, they complained and Don said to Ed Bernstein, you have to go out and fix this. And the only way to fix it's, it's installed. You're going to have to drill holes in it out in place. And they said, OK, well, we, we'd rather have done this in the shop, but we're, we'll do it. And it'll cost da, 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 so much. And Don said, no, no, you, you have to go fix it uh, for free. It's not, it's not right. And he said, well, we, um, Ed said, we did it what you, we did what you wanted. And he said, no, no, it's not right. You do it. And I, I'm younger, I, I'm quite, a, at that point, quite a bit younger than the Bernstein brothers, and I, I knew them, I knew them well, and I said, Ed, you, if you don't mind me advising you on this, go out there, this is not, it's Cincinnati, it's basically just outside of Cincinnati, go out there, do it, don't send him, don't send him a bill, don't send Don a bill, um, take it as a lost leader, just, uh, that's what I would recommend, if you, if, if I can say so, right? And he, they did it. They fixed it. They tightened it up. It, it doubled the amount of screws showing, solved the problem. And uh, Judd was very irritated about it and stopped talking to them. 1977, Bernstein made Judd pieces until Judd died in 94. But he didn't go, he, but he didn't go, he wouldn't go out to Queens to talk to them. People like me or other people who worked for Judd would go out on his behalf. And so th these kind of screw ups, the Ponza screw up, and this this slightly more minor one, he, di he didn't stop using Bernstein Brothers because he, tr he tried another fabricator for a short time, Tritel Gratz, which, is, which did a kind of a bad job. So he went back to Bernstein Brothers, but he didn't like, I'm not going to be their friend. Yeah, not, he didn't become, he, he kind of stopped being their friend and stopped going out there to the shop. So this is another example of can pieces get made without the artist being in the workshop. Um, I'm, I'm trying to remember where, where we started on this whole thing. I actually think that there's a whole bunch of people here who haven't gotten to ask you any questions. It strikes me um, in a normal architectural design situation, 
Drawings are kind of helpful partly because they represent an ideal that everyone can agree is the goal but not achievable. And then the architect and the contractor or fabricator will say, well, can you build it to one eighth of an inch? Or in an engineering application, maybe it's one one twenty-eighth, but there's always an agreement that there will be some deviation. And I'm wondering, you know, for you with no drawings, that sounds like a kind of awkward position to be in potentially. Did Judd just expect total perfection in the object, or did he did you ever discuss a sort of acceptable range of tolerance with him? Was the, was the idea of a construction tolerance even sort of something that existed in his mind? It's a good question. And I, if I'm understanding um, the part that I picked up, uh, the, the term perf perfection, um, that I'm going to I'm going to answer that first. That that's that's a kind of a, a real. I, I don't mean you're you're a misunderstanding on your part, but there is a kind of a Judd pieces have to be perfect to be shown or to be sold kind of thing. And uh, what, if, if you were gonna, if, if Judd were still alive and you were gonna um, be a Judd fabricator, to be a good Judd fabricator is neither to be perfect nor sloppy. And what you want, there's a middle point where the work seems to disappear because if you're good at, at carpentry or at machine work or something, there's always more polishing you can do or more fine tuning kind of you can do. But if it goes beyond a certain point, in the same way that poorly made work just sabotages the work, overly finished work or overly perfect work also sabotages in a way because it's like, oh, how did they do that? If there's too many one amazing angles or amazing, how did they do that in, in a Judd piece, I think it's wrong. And it has to be, I, I like this old fashioned term, somebody, it, oh, this person is a really good mechanic, and it means a good practitioner who does it exactly like the piece should be. And also with in plywood, it's not, this is not um, nickel plated steel or, or, or stainless or something. It's, it has a rough look anyway, because it's got a wood grain to it. So uh, I'm answering at least part of your question that that perfect is not, this, that's, that's a little bit of a myth in Judd. Um, you hear it all the time, the pieces, uh, yeah, unconditional reports and other things, right? Pieces is in excellent condition. It, it, it's not the point fabrication wise, I would say. Well, if I could just ask a quick follow up then, what was the approval process like? Would he just look at it? Would he pull out a tape measure? Would he pull out a caliper? You know, that's kind of what I'm getting at is. Uh, no. One of the reasons I, I lasted so long with Judd, this is a little bit of a throwaway comment, but it, one of them is I, I understood him as a Midwester, as a fellow Midwesterner, and I knew uh, how to live on thin gruel as far as praise is concerned. So I didn't need to, is this okay, is this done, is this okay? I didn't need to do that. There were not any disasters along those lines, in a way. And I took it very seriously, and I don't mind the extra time to, to get it right. I, but I'm not talking about perfect. I'm talking about getting it right is what I'm talking about. Hi, uh, thanks. Um, it, the question I have is actually kind of basic. Uh, I've been wondering, looking at this piece, how it's installed and how it, if it's broken down um, after to deinstall it. And it, hearing you talk about the space behind the piece and the wall and the door, you know, is a revelation. It's kind of like, you know, a, a magical element behind it. And so I'm wondering, is that also, you know, the magic of the piece that people wonder if it is, stays whole or is, you know, made into smaller parts. I don't know. Do people did do, do, do those of you who saw this do do you wonder then? There's there was a um, there, there's some funny stuff written about Judd over the years. The the uh, that Judd is actually despite his anti-illusionism, um, you know that actually he's very illusionistic because his because a long progression looks smaller at one end than the other. There's a lot of stuff about Judd that's not, um, that I don't think stands up over time. That, that illusionism criticism is one of them. But they also have, a wall piece has got to hang on the wall. And this piece, there's no way this can hang on the wall. It ought, in some kind of ideal world, it would be on the floor without a 
pedestal, um, and it can't be pushed back to the wall. You can't have it out and, and do it and push it back. Five forklifts couldn't push it back. You know, so you have to do that. You could consider a jud piece hung on the wall, like you should be able to see everything in a jud piece. You know, all the edges and all everything. You know, those kind of things you've seen written about juds before. It has to hang on the wall. So there's obviously some kind of space back there where it hangs on the wall. I think that stuff is really interesting. I, it's the way I see the piece when I'm making them. I, I see the backs just as much as I see the fronts. But um, I don't find that amazing that, that there are practicalities to it. And I, I think I don't see it as amazing that there has to, this has to be this. This was the only piece that was like that. There wasn't another piece like that. It just had to. You have to get them just right because there has to be, it has to be about two inches on this side smaller than the piece and two inches smaller on this piece and two inches smaller this way so that the piece covers the opening when it's completed. And hopefully you didn't make a mistake on the, about the measurements. But I, I, I'm not so, sure that answers the question. But. I, mean, I, I Just for anyone who came in without having a chance to look at the table, uh, Peter actually brought in both photographs and uh, drawings relating to the piece. And so you'll see a couple, I, there are a couple of photographs there of the piece under construction. So you can actually see, see through the piece in those photographs. Yeah, before the, uh, before the um, I, I don't want to even, I'm, I'm about to say stage, stage opening. It looks like when it's completely unfilled with piece, it looks like a big stage ready for theatrical production. Uh, but then it's slowly, you build it from the bottom up, and pretty soon it's completely um, covered. It has to be from the bottom up. These things are so, it's so heavy. It can't, it's not hung on the wall. It's built from the floor up. I, I guess my, I was just, you know, just wondering if it breaks down to smaller p parts, and then you assemble it's all, it. fits in a 40-foot shipping container if it's skillfully packed. <laughs> I mean, it just it just fits into a you know it's and the piece is made out of the the main sheets are inch and three eighths, which is almost two sheets of regular plywood. There's also three quarters plywood in it, and the backs are three eighths because you don't need heavy. There there are backs on these piece, you know backs that you see there. You don't there, there's no need for that to get so heavy. It has to close it. So there's those those three thicknesses. Yes. So I've gotten a signal that we have time for one or maybe two more questions. Okay, so I'll let you do the um, call. So Hi. Um, thank you for this. It's, there's always more info. It's amazing. And I worked, had the privilege of working with Peter on an exhibition some years ago and got a lot, and there's always more. But we, we, did, a sh we did a show together, and you went to school with Martha, right? Yeah. <laughs> Not at the same time, yes. we're parallel colleagues. But um, my question is kind of a combination of the two you just had, and I'm not, sh and you just spoke to it, but it has to do with in retrospect, because you're speaking today as the maker, and so much hinges on your intuitive feel for what Judd did and didn't want, as opposed to what the academics argue about, which is some notion of consistency, theoretically or conceptually. But is there a consistency in your mind to the logic of what had to be shown as in honest <laughs> and not illusionism, but the effect, in other words, so much of what one thinks about Judd has to do with the absolute consistency between what something is made of and, and what you see, you know, what it is. So let's say color would be as it came, or if there was a shade of color later on, you told me this, it might be plexiglass that's translucent over a paint. That's an honest way of mixing color. But in terms of what you see and what you don't see, or you know what you just said about 
don't want to see a dotted line of screws, right? So you don't want to see how something's fastened. Um, is there a consistency in your mind of how did you make those decisions? There was, in the a, making? There was a piece in um, 70, 1978, there were some small um, plywood um, half meter by meter um, pieces that were sold to a collector in Stuttgart. And um, I got, there, three, there were three pieces, and I got a call um, to, uh, next time I was in Europe, could I go look at them? There was a complaint about the pieces. And the pieces, this and maybe a little bit before this, this is marine plywood, which only means that the glue is um, waterproof. But what it really means is that the, the plies are solid because it's used for boat building. It's still Doug Douglas fir, and it's Douglas fir. All the plies are Douglas fir, right? Which is not what Ponza did. Ponza had this, had this other other materials inside. But um, one of the uh, learning experiences for me was to go and look at these pieces, and they're with regular plywood from the lumber yard, from your from canal lumber, or where you know where I was originally buying this stuff. You you cut the piece, and sometimes there's there are voids. And you don't, what you, you never did was to go back and fill the voids, like fit little peg pieces in there, you know, and so forth. So you, you get what you get in a cheese kind of way, right? And so the, the problem is when you have that and there are those voids, whenever there's a question raised about like, why is this here? And you know, you know da, 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 or, or why are these patches in some kind of triangle, seemingly triangle thing? And Judd is a, is an artist who's, if he's going to put, if there are going to be details in the piece, they want to be his details. And generally speaking, there are not details. Or they are details from the workmanship of the making of the piece. You know, like um, the piece on the third floor at Spring Street where you, where you see the saw cuts because he wanted it done in a very honest, rough way. So you see the saw, saw cuts, but no, mostly you don't see that. And, um, so let me see what the, the where where was the where where did I depart from your question? But it's it's you you need to to combine some of these questions about you know illusionism or um, not what it seems because we, we've had a couple of questions like that. One of the pieces, one of the kind of things where this really comes up is the painted pieces, the aluminum painted pieces, which. Um, because Judd is very clear about his kind of like edginess about paint because you it because it's aluminum, but it's red, and or it's aluminum and it's green or something like that, and you 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 don't you can't see what it is, and that those pieces are a, a little bit of a step away from his. You must be able to see what is going on in this. That doesn't mean you shouldn't try to up the quality of the, of the materials, like we talked about, like get special orders from the West Coast that don't raise all these de unwanted details problems, right? You, you have to try, it's up to the fabricator, I think, to get to try to get rid of those things and you have the piece to look at and you're not given any kind of easy outs by looking at a damaged corner or a scratch or funny uh, fillers or something like that, all, all of which are distractions to the piece that's why damage in Judd's is so uh, unusually um, problematic at a very low level compared to other art paintings, for example, right? Um, but the, the painted pieces are like, you have to do a little bit of um, uh, maneuvering to, to figure out about that because it, it, it does obscure what, I mean, is this a brass underneath there? Is this aluminum underneath there? And I. As a, a quick throwaway answer to that, Judd's kind of serious, almost serious, uh, joking answer to that was, we all know about cars and painted cars, and nobody thinks that this black car is black. If it gets in an accident that you're going to see a scratch that's black underneath it. it, we all know about painted objects such as cars, red, black. And so we, 
says he, accept that as a thing, as a cultural thing, right? We, we accept that. I, I, it, it still could be questioned a little bit, but that's, that's his answer to that, I would say. Thanks. Um, great talk. I, I just had a question. When you were talking about the standard elements of plywood and um, the overall kind of rationality to the work, there's some math in there. There's some, also other things like Fibonacci and things. But with plywood, you have a standard feature. And how do you think that differs from the sculptures that are fabricated in metal? I know there were some that were made originally in plywood and then more, later realized mm. similar in metal. But in terms of really the progressions, let's say, where he's not limited by a standard there are some progressions that there are some plywood wall pieces that have progressions in them, but generally they don't. They're not progressions in the way you're talking about the Fibonacci series and the other kind of myster mysterious uh, number systems, right? But w w I mean, mis not mysterious, but you know, mysterious to you if you didn't, if you're not a graduate student writing a paper on Judd, you know, and and, and analyzing what. Um, what, what system is he using here? I, I think um, you, in this piece also, you, you know there's some kind of system. I'm gonna get back to your Fibonacci series question, but you know there's a system here. You probably can't quite figure it out because it's so big and so spread out, but you know there's a system and it's not random. And sometimes Judd uh, confuses it even more with, uh, with large pieces where he shuffles the order so that if you see a co the, the, the pieces in Marfa at Chinati, the 100 mil aluminum pieces, if you see a correspondence, it's not because he's given you one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and you go, oh, one, oh, yeah. So that's the way they're designed for him. I mean, he, he's not designing randomly, but that's the way they're installed. And if you see a correspondence between number seven and number uh, 90, it's because you were, because you saw it but it's not being handed to you. And so in a Fibonacci series or inverse natural number system or all these, these other number systems in the progressions, which are really quite a bit more about numbers, about um, unusual number systems, if you figure it out or if you never figure it out, it doesn't matter because you realize there's some system there and it's not a random composition. And a Fibonacci is, when, what's the date of Fibonacci? 1600, 1620 or something like that. And Fibonacci, this is a really well-known, this is not uh, really obscure mathematics. It's, it's, it, there's all kinds of things that have Fibonacci series, you know, uh, uh, seashells and things like that. And, and it's something you get out of a book. And it, it's a little less exotic than it sounds because, oh, Fibonacci series, it sounds like a, it sounds like a really interesting, complicated thing, but it's not, you know, it's, it's not. And um, this piece has its own system that, because it's so big, you might have to work at a little bit to figure out. And it's, the upper tier is so high that you can't really get up there with a tape measure and fi figure out that it's four inches. You can maybe guess at it, but it, it doesn't matter because you see that there is some, there is a system there and, I think this is really cool. All, all of this stuff is really cool, including the, the Bernstein progression pieces that you're talking about, right? So. Well, and even with this piece, the angled pieces are necessarily wider than four feet, so. This piece, this is a, this piece in some ways, especially down at this end here, it's a really hard piece to make. It's a really hard piece to make because as you work your way through the progression, if you take, if you've ever cut done any carpentry work, a, a piece that's that thick, flat, at 45 degrees, the, the bevel becomes like that. And at this angle, the bevel becomes like this, which means the point is paper thin. All right, thank you so much. I think we could probably go on for- You have, you have one, time for one more. There's a very uh, important question right here, I can tell. Well, well, we'll have more questions after the formal question period. How's that? I just, I thank you again, Peter and Martha. Thank you so much for doing this. It was, it's a whole layer of information.